tonight, the Jefferson Literary and Debating Society, now in its 187th year of perpetual existence, is both pleased and proud to present the second speaker in its weekly speaker series for the spring semester of 2012, Professor Mark Sheriff. Professor Sheriff will present a speech entitled The Battle for Entertainment, the Internet, SOPA, and Censorship. I have to say we invited Anonymous tonight, but I don't know if they were able to make it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sheriff is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. His teaching focus is in software engineering and database management. His research in software engineering education and software reliability. He received his bachelor's in computer science from Wake Forest University in 2002 and his MS and PhD from North Carolina State University in 2004 and 2007. Professor Sheriff is a recipient of the Trigon Engineering Society Thomas E. Hutchinson Faculty Award, winning in 2011 and being a finalist for the award in 2010. In 2007, Professor Sheriff also was awarded the inaugural Hartfield Jefferson Scholars Teaching Prize and the UVA ACM Computer Science Professor of the Year. The Jefferson Society is indeed honored to host such a distinguished individual this evening. Please stand and join me in welcoming Professor Sheriff. Entertainment, what better way than to just tell you an entertaining story? 
<laughs> so I want to tell you the story this evening. And in this story, there are heroes. There are villains. There are damsels in distress. And if I tell the story right, there are even dragons. <laughs> Big dragons with scary teeth. And this is not Skyrim. <laughs> so, I want to tell you the story. And like any good story, there is a prologue. Except Star Wars, where there's a bad prologue. And <laughs> <laughs> in these stories, there's always the calm voice of the narrator that comes in at the beginning. And so I want to tell you about this time. I want to go back to where our story begins. And our story begins with the beginnings of media. Back to even books and papers and monks copying tomes. I feel like I'm channeling Spaceship Earth right now. <laughs> But let's start with media. Let's start with TV. Let's start with movies. Let's start with radio. When these forms of entertainment came, up, came about, they captivated their audience. Families sat around radios listening to the Green Hornet or other radio plays. When the, when the Howdy Doody show was introduced and kids had television to watch in the mornings, this captivated their audience. And this was a beautiful time for who I'm going to call the content creators. These content creators are kind of the heroes of our story here at the beginning. Because at this time, the business of content is content is scarce. Content is created by a very select group of people. Uh, if you happen to see the movie Hugo, which is an excellent film, you saw you saw some of the beginnings of film and how people created and created, but it was very rare. So people wanted this content. They craved this content. And they were given this content. Let's fast forward to kind of when I was growing up. The 1980s into the 1990s. And during this time, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were born. <laughs> Um, I do not wear a Thundercats t-shirt. <laughs> My entertainment time, particularly on Friday evenings, was in front of the television, as most folk were, I suppose, about my age, who at the time did not have a Nintendo. Um, and there were three main competitors for my entertainment time. That would be NBC, CBS, and ABC. And this was a beautiful time. Because at this point, one out of three ain't bad. You had to be good, but just good enough than the other two guys. You have to be amazing, just had to be good enough. And even if you were just good enough, one out of three ain't bad. That's a pretty good market. That's a pretty good set of people that's always tuned into what you're looking at. So they had it pretty dang good. ABC had most of my time. I mean, let's, you know, there was you know, Family Matters, um, Full House. You know, they had that whole TGI Friday lineup. They had my time, and it worked. And this was the environment for the longest time. But. In any story, the grassy hillside of the sunny day was about to be darkened. Because this time, our villain is here. Picture the thunderclaps above. Picture the clouds rolling in. As the villains appear. <laughs> now. <laughs> because some of you 18-year-olds have no idea what the hell I'm holding. <laughs> this is called a set tape. <laughs> it has magnetic media 
media on it and holds things. Oh, I broke the case. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, honey. If anyone is curious, this particular tape holds I'll, I, I Go Blind by Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> totally clips in the heart. <laughs> Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> This has bathe. Have a Vic. Have Wow, these are scary villains, aren't they? They're, uh, they're utterly terrifying. That wasn't the real first villain, actually. I mean, if you really want to be serious about it, the villain that was actually taken before the knights of the realm, the U.S. Circuit Court <laughs> was Betamax. <laughs> <laughs> so, for those of you that don't know about this particular case, the Universal Pictures versus Sony, or mostly called the Betamax case. Now, the Betamax case had gone through several different iterations at this point. It had gone through the lower courts, it had gone through the circuit courts decisions back and forth, but at this point, the Ninth Circuit Court had said, VCRs are illegal. VCRs, no. It made its way to the High Court. It made its way to the High Court, and arguments were presented as arguments are ought to do. And the heroes looked like they were going to win. I mean, really, the art heroes, the content creators, these are the people that have been entertaining us for years. They were going to get their ultimate victory. But the villain always has a plan. <laughs> a Xanatos Gambit. They know that there is something there. They know there is a soul they can touch. And at this point, it still seems not likely that something could happen because at this point it was going to be a 6-3 decision in favor of the Ninth Circuit Court decision, which means that VCRs are going to be illegal. <clears throat> but the villains had their ally. And they found that ally. And I say, look at one his dishes of terror! <laughs> <laughs> look at that bow tie! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah. He's been around a while. You know, I mean, he's not, he, he retired, but, you know. He's the guy we got VCRs. He's the reason. <laughs> he had a very interesting plan, and the plan worked beautifully. Justice Stevens was on the dissenting side at the time. Obviously, because he was one of the three. And the arguments kept going back and forth, back and forth. That basically the idea was is that this technology had the ability to infringe, and therefore the ability to infringe eclipses all other things. But Justice Stevens did something brilliant. I come to bury Caesar not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is off interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. Many of you probably have heard that before. The purpose being that when Antony began giving that speech, he gave it just as he meant. He came to condemn Caesar. But by the end of the speech, he had convinced everyone that he was there to show how Brutus had actually really stabbed him in the back. <laughs> so what Justice Stevens did is he wrote a dissenting opinion that if you changed just a handful of words, it could be turned into the majority opinion. He wrote his dissenting opinion as a majority, almost as an ironic fashion, and used it as a vehicle to convince two justices over to his side. And five to four, we were able to have our VCRs. 
Here's a quote. If there are millions of owners of BTRs, thankfully we got rid of that acronym, uh, who make copies of televised sports events, religious broadcasts, and educational programs, and if the proprietors of those programs welcome the practice, the business of supplying the equipment that makes such copying feasible should not be stifled simply because the equipment is used by some individuals to make unauthorized reproductions of respondents this fundamental idea in this case set the precedent. It set the precedent that time shifting is legal. We can record something and we can enjoy that content later. We have permission to enjoy that content at one time and to use that content, to consume that content later is allowed. There was a safe haven for technology. You were allowed to build technology that had the potential to do things like this, that had the potential to improve our lives. And if there was the chance that there might be an infringement, if there was a chance that there might be something illegal done with the technology, this would not be reason to stop it immediately. Due process. Our building supply. Our content creators go back, the heroes defeated. What should they do? Well, they know the law now is not on their side. Somehow the villains have corrupted the king's court. Surely there must be something else they can do. <sighs> we will go straight to the tools that they use. We will attack the technology itself in the return of the content. <laughs> <laughs> the second part's always the best. That first chapter, of course, was not the end of the story. Any epic of this scale requires another verse, requires another chapter. And so, we move forward. We move forward all the way to 1982. And this was a quote at the time, by Jack Valenti, president of the MPAA, which one of our favorite organizations. <laughs> I say to you that the VCR is to the American film producer and the American public as the Boston Strangler is to the woman alone at home. <laughs> really? <laughs> the VCR is an avalanche, a tidal wave will make industry bleed and bleed and hemorrhage. My gosh. <laughs> now, trying to program the time on a VCR might make you bleed and bleed. <laughs> but I, if I hit you with a VCR, you might bleed and It is a good thing that in our society we do not have such rhetoric still. <laughs> <laughs> that led us to the Audio Home Recording Act of 1992. Now, the Audio Home Recording Act of 1992 sounds extremely bland, <laughs> and it kind of is, except for what it did. This was the first attack on technology, the first real attack on technology, in my opinion. This is where copy protection was introduced. The home audio, the home audio. <laughs> The Audio Home Recording Act of 1992 stipulated particularly that digital tapes must have copy protection built into them. But it had something else that was really <coughs> the problem. This is really where we see the true colors of our heroes and just how far they're willing to go. Because now, in order to use technology that you have purchased, you owe them tribute. This is the first place where the idea of royalties on blank media came into play. So now, when you purchase a blank tape, a blank CD, or something along those lines, 2% or so, it varies, goes to pay royalties for people who could have been hurt if you dared copy their material. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I declare to you that as of 1992, you are all guilty. Most of you weren't born. Some of you weren't born. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I was born. You were guilty. You were guilty before being anything. Congratulations. The burden proof is now on us. But we live with this. I, I wouldn't think anyone would argue that Blockbuster Video in the 1990s had problems. I think we could probably say that Blockbuster and other home movie places did just fine. I think we could easily say that the VHS, the home, uh, home recording market, did quite well, despite even this thing. And so none of us really paid attention. Not real. Not real. But we did. We did in 1998. Because this wasn't enough at this point. Now, this thing called the computer was being used. And, sorry, that particular stat somehow threw me off. I was like, the computer, yes. Oh. <laughs> Digital Rights Management, DRM. You've probably heard the term. Yes! Yes! Yes, indeed! <laughs> now, not only was DRM required, DRM, you could not circumvent it. It was a crime to do that. And the penalties for doing such were astronomical. Because, obviously, if one audio track was copied, that's worth millions of potential sales. <laughs> Cases have gone before courts where people who have been accused and found guilty of sharing 24 songs were ordered to pay over a million dollars in damages. This is our backdrop. This is the beginning of the story. This is how we have come to this particular spot. Time has marched forward. And we have moved into a very exciting time. Very, very exciting time, in my opinion, because frankly, well, it's what I teach, so I have to think it's good. <laughs> so, as we have marched forward, we find new heroes. As opposed to the Pirates of Silicon Valley. <laughs> Noah Wiley is Steve Jobs. Got it. Got it great. Yeah. That's about how many people saw the movie, so don't worry about it. Oh, it's oh, about not seeing the movie. Okay. Forget mixtapes. Forget mixtapes. Right here. Forget time shifting. Forget all that. That's not the battleground anymore. That was the beginning of the battle. That was the first line. That was the first thing we had to deal with. Because the problem now is the content creators are heroes from on high that have been providing us with content for years and years and years. <coughs> they have more competition now. And the problem is, is that there are new content creators. These content creators don't ask for anything. These content creators want to share. These content creators want to take the ideas of others and merge them together and produce new works. These content creators are you. We are content creators. We are in this battle. This is not a battle between media and Google, media and Microsoft, media and Facebook. It's a battle with us. Because we are now the content creators on the web. Every blog post you make, every comment you make, every bit of karma you get on Reddit. <laughs> that is now the content. Every lecture we record. I record every one of my lectures when I remember. 
<laughs> you can download any of my lectures. I release them as, in, 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 a, in a format uh, under the Creative Commons license, which means that anyone can take them and do what they want to with them in a non, uh, non-profit way. That scares media. That scares the traditional television moguls, the movie <coughs> studios, the radio producers. Because now, we, we are the ones they're competing with. And there's a lot more of us. But, self-preservation is a very powerful motivator. And media has been doing quite well for 50 plus years. They've been making a lot of money. They've been doing very, very well. And I do not, I do not want to take away from what they've done because the years of film, that art form is beautiful. There is nothing to say that we do not have a lot to owe the movie industry and the radio industry and the television industry because they have given us a lot of joy in our lives and a lot of who, what our culture is. But there is a line where we have to start playing together. I liken the situation to a kid on a sled. Don't worry, this is from my neighborhood. I have permission to use this image. <laughs> I took it. You have permission to take this image and do whatever you want to with it, I suppose. Regardless. It doesn't come out terribly well. This is from the Snowmageddon of 2008. Nine. 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 Thank you. Whatever. <laughs> I have more pictures. I can show you. But regardless, there was lots of good sledding going down here. Matter of fact, my wife, who's, who's here with me tonight, we were going sledding down this area. We were very excited because our next door neighbor is a doctor. We're like, we're going sledding down a hill. Who better to have sledding with you than a doctor? <laughs> and so we were joking with him. Oh, this is great. You know, we're with his daughter. We slide down. It's great. The son breaks a bone. He just looked at me and said, Mark. I'm a radiologist. <laughs> I can look at the x-ray and tell you how bad the break is, but I can't do anything about it. I said, oh, and your wife a doctor? She's a, she's a veterinarian. <laughs> oh well. Boosh! No, no. Media is that kid up here at the top of the hill. We all know this kid. You might have been this kid at some point. That kid sitting at the top of the hill, holding the sled, looking down, saying, I don't know about this. <laughs> Are you sure? I really like it up here. I can, I can see. I can see a lot of stuff. Hi! <laughs> you okay, Dan? Yeah, that looks, that looks good. Oh, wait, I have to go sledding? Okay. <laughs> Have you seen this kid? They start going down the hill and they dig in their heels and they put their hands down and they are scraping and clawing to make sure they're not making their way down the hill as fast as they potentially could. You might have been that kid. You might have been the kid who went skiing. And you're like, double black diamond, pshaw. <laughs> in the Appalachian Mountains all the time. I'm sure they're the same here in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> and you get up there and the angle of descent is something like, oh, that? <laughs> I don't think this is an angle. <laughs> I think it's negative. <laughs> and you start to go down and you just go, <laughs> and you slide down. Media is that kid. That hill is the internet. That hill is technology. We, we, the content creators of today, we know that hill, it's fun. Reddit is fun. YouTube is fun. We like to share. We like to be out there and be a community. That hill is terrifying to them. Because to them, that is their content out of their control. That is them spiraling down a hill and they cannot stop.
That's today's battle. That is the framework of today's battle. <clears throat> many, many engagements have happened in this battle. Some have been won by the heroes. Some have not. Unfortunately, probably one of our greatest champions in this battle, Steve Jobs, who is no longer with us, had the ability and just the raw gall to tell the record companies, you want to deal with us? You want to deal with iTunes? You're going to sell your music at 99 cents a pop. Oh, no, 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 this Justin Bieber track, this is easily five dollars. <laughs> you pay me. No. 99 cents. We want Diario. Fine. And then six years later, Steve Jobs got them to go back on that. We have had many battles. But this is this battle. And this battle just came to a crest. We all know what this battle was. <coughs> this is the battle of about a few weeks ago. It was interesting because when I was telling some of the other professors in the department that I was going to be speaking on this tonight, what they told me was, well, isn't that passe now? Isn't that over? Haven't we gotten past that? <laughs> And then I punched him. <laughs> Not hard. Professor Humphreys. <laughs> this battle is not over. This battle will never be over. Let's talk about how this particular battle went. This is the moratorium, the, 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 the post-op, so to speak. What happened? What happened? What happened with this bill? Well, I think we all know what SOPA is, because thankfully, a piece of technology news made it into mainstream news. And I do not have to hear about it only from Techzilla and Leo Laporte and these other folks that I enjoy listening to. Thankfully, this was picked up by both the Fox Newses and by the MSNBCs. That's the interesting thing about the Stop Online Piracy Act. I don't care in this room what your political affiliation is. This is not a red issue. This is not a blue issue. This is not a chartreuse issue. This is a, <laughs> this is a citizen of the world issue. This is a technology issue. So how did this break down, right? Well, content creators wanted the ability to find people that were infringing on their rights, and they wanted them ripped from the internet. I mean, I literally am seeing, I'm seeing Mortal Kombat like, <laughs> I see this sort of mechanism. Forget surgical strike. No, 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 no. Big red button. Those are much easier. You can hit those with your <laughs> I was very proud of our news media during this time because for the most part they made this not sound ridiculously hard to understand but this is what I teach so indulge me for a few moments because I think this is cool <laughs> Yeah. Uh, back to my standard class stuff, since this is kind of what I'm going to do in the next minute or so. The domain name system. I want to know right now, don't look at your phones. No, I'm no, serious. Don't look at your phones when I ask you this question. How many phone numbers do you have memorized? Think. If you have at least one phone number memorized, raise your hand, please. If you have at least two, keep your hand up. Three, keep your hand up. Four, keep your hand up. Five, six, seven, eight. Be 
people have impressive memories nowadays. <laughs> Most of us have our iPhone, or our Blackberry, or our Android. Not many of us actually memorize phone numbers quite as much as we used to. I know my phone number, I know my wife's phone number, I know my parents' home number, I know my in-law's home number, I know my office phone number. Notice that most of my phone numbers allow me to call me. <laughs> they are not extremely useful. <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> yes! <laughs> so, I can call my in-laws. Am I here? <laughs> the domain name system is the phone book of the internet. That's all it is. Do not, do not believe that it is anything more than that. It is the phone book of the internet. When you go to your computer and you tell it, I would like to go to bbc.co.uk, uh, it is going to go to the nearest phone book and look up what is called the IP address, the Internet Protocol address. Now, for most of those, they are quite normal looking, something along these lines, 212.58.246.93. Many of you might have seen your own IP addresses look slightly differently. How many of you have seen an IP address at home that says 192.168.0.1.2.3, any of those? Yes. We have a certain range of IP addresses that are reserved for certain purposes. 192.168. It's a technical term, don't stretch this in my that is reserved for local networks. And we have something called network address translation, which means that when you are at home and you have five computers, a 360, a Wii, two iPhone, oh wait, this is my house, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what would that be? A desktop, two laptops, a 360, a Wii, a DS, PSP, a TiVo. It gets, it gets long, it's a lot. A Roku, yeah, the Roku. It's really cool. Even. Woot, it was 50 bucks. It was really cool. <laughs> Do I get product placement money for this? <laughs> so, all of them share the exact same IP address on the internet. And what happens is, is whenever I make a connection out from my computer to the internet, it goes through my router, and the router translates and says, oh, I know that Mark's laptop has requested bbc.co.uk. So it is going to now wait for traffic to come back from bbc.co.uk and it knows to send it to my computer. That's network address translation. What this means is that I have 10 devices effectively sharing one actual IP address on the internet. Because I don't know if you know this or not, we're kind of running out of these. And it's kind of scary. It's kind of like we're running out of addresses. Where do I live? I don't know. 16 and a half street. <laughs> that was computer. Through here over to Carruthers Hall. And then there, there's an uplink 
to what is called Internet 2. Internet 2 is a major backbone for educational institutions that gets us out to the major superhighways of the Internet. Some of those superhighways are very easy to see. Level 3 is actually one of the largest. It actually serves most of Virginia. So when traffic heads out, it will go to Washington. And notice it kind of bounces around in Washington. The traffic then goes to New York. So my packet from here to Washington, D.C., from D.C. up to New York, then it went across the pond over to London, bounced around a little bit, and then ended up at the BBC. It's really kind of cool. We can see all of this. There are tools that will actually show you the paths. Because the way the internet traffic works is that it is agnostic to what the traffic is. We put a packet, a piece of information, literally. Don't think of it. It's not complicated. It's, it's an envelope. It's an envelope with data in it, and it has an address, and it has a from, and you put it on the net, and at every hop it says, what's the next best option? How can I get to where I want to go? If I try to go somewhere else, let's go trace, root, um, <coughs> CNN. We're going to bounce around here at UVA again. We're going to go to Washington. We're going to go south to Atlanta. CNN servers actually don't like to play dice, which is OK. I don't, I don't like them too much. Um, let's see here. Uh, no, Google's boring. Reuters. Ooh, how about, what's the website? <laughs> I spell share two R's. I'm allowed to not spell right, okay? Uh, let me tap this, uh, the airline for Portugal? I don't know. We'll find out in a second. <laughs> well, it's bouncing around in New York. Oh, come on. Lamont in France, L E M O N D E dot F R. L E M O N D dot F R. D E dot F R. We were confused. Washington to Newark to London to Paris to Newark. That was my turn. <laughs> Thing about it. 
That's not the worst. That's not the thing that really concerned us. What concerned us is that this gave the ability of media companies to assume guilt before being proven innocent. There was no due process of law, not really. It was a little bit of oversight. But in general, what it allowed the media company to do is to pull a site to have it pop up with that blocking ad to say, you are not allowed to talk to these people. That has an incredibly chilling effect on so many different things. My personal note to Congress is this. It is no longer okay to not know how the internet works. I watched some of the, of the, do I even want to call them hearings? <laughs> we should get a bunch of nerds in here and tell us what's going on. I call them experts. <laughs> I call them people who know what's going on, at least in this realm. I don't know how to fix my car. I don't know how to fix the economy. I can send a packet on the internet. Ask me, I can tell you. But that wasn't quite the way it went down. We had members of Congress who were sitting to the side on their Blackberries, tweeting of all stupid things about how lame this was. Lols. <laughs> <laughs> They're using the very thing that they are now trying to create a police for? Is that not the height of being hypocritical? Even more so, if you went to their Twitter pages, Democrat and Republican, if you went to their Twitter pages, the background images that many of them use are copyright by someone else. <laughs> and they're making laws about this. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Forget the fact that DNS doesn't work or breaking DNS is not going to work. Forget the fact that the law as written doesn't work. That wasn't their goal. That wasn't media's goal. Media's goal here was to go after technology. Media's goal here is to go after the thing that allowed, the thing that gave the permission to infringe, the potential to infringe, it was not about any of the rest of it. That power would be very, very useful. It would be our hero's Excalibur. And then this day came. January 18th, 2012, which fantastically for a computer science professor was the first day of class. Because I can talk about it. And I had students, I said, hey, go to Wikipedia and look this up. And they go, hey! <laughs>
and a host of other companies took out full-page ads in the New York Times and in the USA Today to tell them how dumb this idea was. They didn't listen. Google and Microsoft, in case you don't know, they have a lot of money. <laughs> and they have powerful lobbyists on their side, too, which is good for us. Because in a lot of instances, we need, we need a big brother of this. <laughs> we do, to some degree. But nothing had happened up to that point. The bill with uh, PIPA, the Senate bill, went through swimmingly. It went through long before this even happened. It was only when Lamar Smith of Texas and Paul Sofa that this happened. By show of hands, how many of you contacted the representatives that day? Now, that, that is a pretty good number for people sitting just in this room about anything. <laughs> I'm very proud. I, I like that. I just keep my hand <laughs> I did. I should put my hand up. I, put, I, I contacted my representatives as well. Congress is used to a lot of things. They're used to people yelling at them. Let's be honest. I mean, if you're in a red district and you're a blue person, then you do got a lot of yelling. If you're a blue person and a red, I mean, it, it just, it's, it's just the way the system works. You know, they're used to people yelling. Even when people win elections, it's like, it was 55 to 45. It's a landslide. It's like, almost half the people hate you. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, these landslides, you know, I'm no politics professor by any stretch of the imagination. But, in general, you didn't win that much. Something happened that day. And the internet got angry. You don't want to anger the internet. It's kind of like prodding a bear. <laughs> and lots of stuff was sent. Lots of calls were made. Lots of emails were sent. And I would like to share with you some of the correspondence that I actually had. I received... Now I received a letter from Representative Hurt. I, I feel for the man because his name is Hurt. With the last name, I'm serious. With the last name Sheriff, I have suffered a lot of jokes. I mean, it's really bad when you're going through customs in Switzerland and even they're like, oh, Sheriff, I shot the Sheriff. I'm like, son of a. <laughs> Besides, hurt Congress. Okay. <laughs> Dear Dr. Sheriff, I hate being called that. I do. It sounds like a bad show on Lifetime. <laughs> Thank you for your recent communication regarding HR 3261, the Stop Online Piracy Act. I appreciate your taking. I oppose SOPA as it is currently written, and I share your concerns about the potential unintended consequences of overly broad online piracy legislation. Intellectual property is a driver of economic wealth, innovation, and job creation. It is important to protect intellectual property. Uh, I think you can guess what the rest of the guys have. <laughs> but I got a letter, and it's signed. And you know that's good. You know, honestly, props to him. You know, whether you're red or blue, whether you, you know. Props to your congressman writing a letter back. I like that. Hey, he signed it unless he has a very, very, very good stamp. <laughs> Here's what I got from Senator Webb. Now, I actually emailed Senator Webb and Senator Warner and Representative Hurt back at Christmas time when this was all starting to get ramped up. And this was the first response I got from him. And this response. Came January 5th in response to a message dated December 20th. I don't blame him for that. Christmas holiday, I don't really care. I got an email back. Great. As you may know, the Protect ID Act and SOPA both seek to provide an expedited process for cracking down on counterfeit products and pirated content distributed over the internet, blah, blah, blah. It's already passed the Judiciary Committee. As uh, things go forward, I'll always keep Virginians in mind. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> So I sent a letter to him on blackout day. Last night, I'm not kidding you, last night I was sitting in a meeting and my email flashed on my phone because 
check my email like I'm going to win a prize. And it came up, and I got a new message from Senator Fenn. How exciting. And I started reading it. And then I noticed. <laughs>
suppressed in some way, we're going to have this debate. We're going to have this argument. Here's the latest one. Actually, it's not the latest one. Many of you might or might not have heard about this. ACTA, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Act, was actually started back in the Bush era. Second Bush. It was already ratified by the U.S. over a year ago. It's an international trade uh, agreement that has to do with uh, copyright laws that span borders. This would have the potential of forcing Congress to follow along with potential international treaties, whether they like it or not. Uh, Representative Issa from, um, from California, who's one of the authors of the open bill, stated, I don't even get to vote for ACTA. So how can I, how can I make major comment on it? Which is kind of part of the problem. This bill, or this treaty, was actually ratified, well, created in secret. That's half the problem. That's most of the problem. When it came out, our friends in Europe went in a rage. To them, this was their so. People resigned in protest out of the European Parliament there, dealing with IP over this issue. And part of the problem now is that the internet is kind of a frothiness about itself, about going after things. And now I want you to realize that everything about ACTA that you know might not necessarily be right. Because hyperbole kind of happens on the internet a bit. <laughs> most of the most onerous parts of ACTA were actually removed from the treaty. I'm not saying it's good legislation. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying this is an answer to our problems. I'm saying it's not quite as bad as probably some of the internet would be to believe. There's an excellent article on Ars Technica, which is an authority in things like this, that does break things down very succinctly with lawyers. Always helps. <laughs> because I am not a lawyer, and that is the stupidest acronym ever on the internet. <laughs> In my Lewis Black book, sorry. <clears throat> but it was created in secret. And it would force developing nations to follow copyright laws that would probably hurt them. But you were never there. <laughs> there are points to a pastor and an apprentice. Coming up now is the Trans-Pacific Agreement. It too has been created in secret. It too will do things like try to prevent the, the spreading of open source software that has the ability to share. We are very lucky that there are so many of us. We are very lucky that we, the content creators, that we are the heroes now, you have powerful allies in Google, in Microsoft, in, in the EFF, very worthy organization. So what can you do? Stay informed. It's the best thing you can do is stay informed. Read the blogs, read the articles, find the wheat from the chaff, and know what is actually going on. Okay? It does, it's the harder part, but you can certainly do it. Have an appreciation for technology and for computing. Have an understanding as to what computing does in our lives nowadays. Computing touches everything that we do. Computing touch, touches everything from finance, to health, to your school records, to rolling up to a light at the, at the stoplight to make it turn, <coughs> to the vending machine, to your toaster. Some of them. <laughs> Computing is everywhere. And I want everyone to realize that. Engineers, we shove it in your face a lot. <laughs> we do. College students, we need to shove a little harder. You can take my class. <laughs> 
I shut a lot. <laughs> but I do have a number of college students who come over to take uh, my class. And while programming might not be your thing, I think having an appreciation for coding, having an appreciation for how software works in your life is important. It is a new form of literacy. It is something that needs to be taught in STEM schools. It needs to be taught at the elementary and the middle school level. Be involved. Let the media companies know that you will pay for their content. I'm not telling you not to go watch Smash when it comes out of the Super Bowl. I'm not telling you not to go enjoy Firefly every time it comes out of the Super Bowl. I'm telling you that we, as content creators, owe the same respect to the other content creators that came before us to pay for what we consume iTunes makes things very easy. iTunes makes things extremely easy. As long as you log in, you haven't logged in on more than five computers, and you have your mic, but in general, most people can use iTunes. Netflix, streaming movies over Netflix. We are paying for that content. Let content creators know. If you missed an episode of SVU for some reason, don't try to watch SVU. <laughs> if you miss an episode of SVU, don't go download it. Go buy it off iTunes. I will admit, in my weaker days, oh, before I had seen the light, <laughs> back when the devil was upon my shoulder, back when money was scarce because I was a student in college, and I was tempted. By the heathens. <laughs> it was just an episode of SVU. I mean, come on. I got a nice email from NBC. And I said, sorry. And it was taken care of. And I didn't go to jail. And it was lovely. Because I didn't go to jail. <laughs> because I watch Lock Up on MSNBC sometimes. I don't know. Pay for your content. I would pay for the ability to buy a game on my 360 and I could then play it on my Mac and play it on my PC, all through one account, all through Steam. I would pay for the ability to buy a season of a television show and be able to watch it on my television, on my iPad, on my iPhone. I would pay for the ability to buy my content and use it the way I can use it. I did not buy a license to use your material. I bought a copy of it to use it. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but pay for your content. Okay? Really, truly, pay for your content. iOS has the right idea. Buying a game that can be played on both your iPhone, your iPod, and your, and your iPad, buying one copy of it, installs on all devices. This is where we need to move. It's really weird that Apple, of all places, now, let me, let's, let's not, let's not cut hairs here. Do I like Apple? Yeah. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Their walled garden has worked pretty dang well, to a degree. Pay for your cost. We're standing at the top of this hill. We're standing there with all the other content creators in the United States. We're standing there with our content creators across the world. Because this is not a US issue. It is a world issue. And we are standing there looking down the hill. And we need to go down the hill together. We need to convince media that we will be with them. We will pay for their content. There are no heroes. There are no villains. We are all content creators. We all want to create, we all want to share, we all want to entertain. I hope I have entertained you somewhere this evening. I hope you're forward to the libraries and quadrants. Thank you very much.
Do you have to ask questions? Uh, I did not. I went five minutes shy of my goal, which is probably the way I usually teach class. So there you go. Uh, is there anything that you would like me to talk about? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mr. Sheriff. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, definitely on the more amusing side than a lot of our other ones. I do not. Amusing. Entertaining and amusing. I'm so bad. <laughs> One of the nicest compliments I've ever received on my teaching evaluations is going to sheriff's class is like going to a stand-up routine. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Yes, ma'am. I feel a little bit silly, but I still don't understand exactly what SOPA is proposing to do. No, for instance, like with with something like piratebay.org, would the name piratebay.org be taken out of the address book? That is correct. That is exactly right. You, you, have, you have the exact right idea of it. The idea is that we would remove the ability to look up that site. That was the heart of it. Um, there are other aspects of the bill that were targeting um, getting payments to the site and that sort of thing. And those, those aspects still actually exist in open. Um, they're, they're, they're targeted a little bit more surgically as opposed to more of a nuclear option to just kind of remove it from the net. But uh, in general, uh, the thrust was to remove the domain name server, which also would mean that policing of the content falls on the content distributor. So for instance, if you were to post something infringing on Twitter, it would be up to Twitter to make sure that you did not post something infringing, lest Twitter itself was removed from the domain name server. And as soon as it costs money for a content provider to police that sort of material, which is impossible. It's like me walking around grounds trying to make sure no one curses. <laughs> It's not worth the time, it's not worth the money. And that's what would that's that whole chilling effect on, on free speech. Yes. So great talk. Uh, I, I think that code is also content, and you briefly touched upon uh, open source. Um, could you further expand upon like the free software federation and GPL and how that relates to innovation? So the so the, the question is related to free and open source software, and that is at some level a whole talk unto itself. Um, Very briefly, I'll say this. Software that is considered free or open source, and what that means is that we provide not only the software, we, we provide the, the code underneath it that created that software such that you can adjust it and do your own things with it and use it on your own and, and, and kind of make it evolve and flourish. Um, some licensing mechanisms are almost virus-like, and I don't mean that in a negative way per se, I mean it just that's kind of the nature of the way the license works, is that the software is released and anything that is, uses that software, builds that software in, is required to also release under a similar license. So that's what I mean by virus-like. Now, from a content perspective, um, there isn't really, in my opinion, uh, a push to shut down the notion of free open source. What there is a notion to put to push down against is some particular uses of free and open source. Particularly, there are some aspects of ACTA, I believe, that would make it to where free and open source software could not be allowed to play things that had DRM in them. So, for instance, an open source DVD player, that sort of thing. So, um, I don't know which path to go down on this. Um, I don't know how much that it would have been affected per se by, by SOPA. Uh, it certainly would have been affected by ACTA. And that's one of the reasons why the EFF took such an interest in ACTA in particular. Um, it's not the, the, the open source movement that I worry for. It's more what then people could say we're allowed to make open source software for. If that makes sense. Did I answer your question? That was one of those like, eh, sort of things. Uh, you can catch me off one. Maybe I'll understand better. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Jared, thank you so much for coming to us in this uh, tonight. Um, so you said when you showed us examples of finding, going to sites like BBC and La Monde and all that, how does SOPA affect uh, find, finding domain names um, in the international scene? Like, can it stop you from finding, or like, could you get a VPN and like 
find uh, a domain name from yeah. that perspective? Or? Could you, so basically the question is, is how does SOPA affect the internet, would affect internationally? Um, the way the internet works right now is that when you make a request out to ask for an address, your domain name server default one is set by whoever has given you your IP address. So for instance, many of you probably have Comcast at home, and how many of you when using Comcast at home have accidentally typed in an incorrect address, you have this weird like, the Comcast search page for the, yeah, some of you giggle or not, yeah, you've seen that before. Well, what's happening here is that Comcast has actually subverted their DNS server that if you type something incorrect that it's not in their phone book, they're actually sending you to their own place. So. You can always change the phone book that you want to use. You can change your phone book to a phone book that is hosted in Australia if you wanted to. It might take a little bit longer for you to do lookups, but they might not be obeying so or someone else could set their own DNS. So it just it, it would break the internet for people that don't know how to go in and make those changes. I could bypass it in about two minutes. Um, most people in here can bypass it in about five minutes because the instructions about yay long. So it does have an effect because by default you're going to go to the nearest phone book to do a lookup, and as long as that nearest phone book is in the United States, they would have to uh, uh, follow the sub rule. But um, if I looked at one in France, I could probably still get to that site. Yes, sir. Thank you for the lecture. As one who says you enjoy sharing information, I'm interested in hearing your reaction to Google's new privacy policy. Oh man, <laughs> Google's new privacy policy. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll be upfront. I have not read the official privacy policy fully yet. Okay. Here's my opinion on privacy policies in general. Privacy policies in general need to be readable and understandable by everyday users. <laughs> To some degree, the content of a privacy policy, depending on the website we're talking about, is somewhat immaterial because if the policy is upfront and plain spoken about what they're doing, you at least know what sort of muck you're getting into. So that's the first thing. So I applaud Google for, for basically combining their privacy policy down into something that I see as being much more readable and understandable. The idea of sharing data across internal applications of Google, in my opinion, uh, is privacy on the internet is somewhat of a unicorn. <laughs> um, I understand the, the desire for it, but, uh, of course. But on some level, um, when information is out, information is out. And if Google can provide me with appropriate services because they can merge my information amongst the services they already provide, and I'm comfortable with what Google is doing with my data, then on that level I'm okay with it. Uh, it's when data is shared between organizations without knowledge that really things get really kind of hairy in my opinion. So again, I have not read it fully. I don't know exactly what it says. Um, but I, I do I do applaud um, combining the information out of something that, that is parsable by the other users. Yes, ma'am. I think for the talk, um, this is more of a speculative question, but one of your quick points is that this issue is not a random loop. It's kind of internet user culture. Um, what do you see that internet user face as having the potential to do as kind of this new Upcoming <laughs> well, the first thing we have to do is, if we consider the redditors of the world, or the U.S. for that fact, um, we need to consider just voting in general. Let's be honest, there is a reason why some of the major things that are talked about in political races are Medicare and prescription drugs and things like that, because uh, older Americans vote much more reliably than, than folk in general are in <laughs> y'all's age. I guess I don't, usually. Whatever. Um, so first we have to become a voting group, to some degree. We have to show that we're willing to vote. Now, we showed very effectively that we are willing to complain. <laughs> and that's a good start, because being involved in the process is the first thing. But when the first Tuesday rolls around, 
and the year is an odd number. I want people showing. Um, and I think it's going to take that sort of showing before something really major occurs, such that the, that the, the internet block is really seen. But the internet block, the thing is that I grew up, I grew up playing games on what was actually called the Sears video game system. It was a version of the Intellivision. Most of you grew up probably, your first system might have been an N64, might have been, might have been a PlayStation 1, that sort of thing. I, I'm getting, there's actually a point. The average video game player age now is 38 years old. The average video game player age is 38 years old. We are starting to age into the point where those of us who are internet users are aging into the, where we are in that block that does vote for all. So I think that part of it is a time thing. I think part of it is that the, the generation uh, Xers are starting to, to kind of get to that point where they are more involved in the political process, which is a very good thing. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we see such things as YouTube debates and Twitter debates and Facebook debates. <laughs> and I don't want to see a Reddit debate. That would be ugly. <laughs> Although, how could it be any uglier than any other debate we've seen this season? <laughs> Let's be honest. It's been, it's been touchy. So, I think that there are Congress people that recognize these issues and are working very well towards them. Isa, who is Republican, comes from the uh, general Silicon Valley area, works very hard on these issues. The fact that our Senator Mark Warner has picked it up, I'm very proud of that. I'm very glad that he's picking it up. You know, there are a lot of things for, for our Congress people to pay attention to. There's enough of them that some of them can pay attention to this more. Those are the people that we need to, to focus on and let them know what's going on. So I think that we can become a, 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 a more of a push, more of an influence, but I think that there's a chicken and the egg problem in that this group needs to start voting in bigger numbers to start the, the, the lunch going. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm actually, thank you for the lecture. I'm actually uh, first year in your computer science class. It was interesting. You have all work to do. <laughs> But um, I remember there was action to block Google in China. Would that be through the same mechanisms that SOPA would? I'm sorry, say it one more time? Yeah, uh, there was action to block Google in China. Would that be through the same mechanisms that SOPA would realize? Action to block Google in China. Yes. Even our heroes have weaknesses. Um, Google and China have a very, very, very interesting relationship. Uh, Google has blocked some search requests from China. China has hacked Google. It's a very odd relationship. Um, the things that Sokol would potentially have done are not the same technologically as what is, that is, but could have the similar effects in that you'd be looking for certain information and because it has to be removed from search engines in addition to DNS searches, that yes, um, removing some searches, um, it, it, it is a slightly different mechanism, but some of the effect would be very similar. It, there was some hyperbole in the news when it was, you know, we're turning into China when it comes to internet. Uh, even with SOPA, yeah, it's bad. China is still bad. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, what were your views on the recent uh, shutdown of the site that upload? You know what's funny? A uh, 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 professor actually came to my office and said, are you going to be prepared to talk about mega upload? She's <laughs> like, I guess. <laughs> Bet you get a question. I owe, I owe him a question. Um, I think, so for those of you that don't know, mega upload is a site where people would upload various large files for usually the intent of breaking copyright. Um, their argument was, oh, it's, there are legitimate uses for it. Yes, there are. There are. Um, what I think that 
The show that a mega upload sh uh, upload. The show that a mega upload shows is that even without SOPA, the U.S. had enough influence to go to Australia and to Estonia and to a few other countries and still place people under arrest. So why the hell do we need SOPA? You seem to have shown pretty well you can shut down foreign companies without. How they managed to do that, I do not know. But they found a way somehow. Um, you know, it was part of the reason the Napster got shut down. It's a whole other interesting topic. Uh, and Kazaa. Here's one for you. Kazaa. Anyone use Kazaa at some point? Yeah. You know what the founders of Kazaa went on to, to go found? Skype. Skype. It's amazing what technology can do. So um, I, that's the interesting thing about Mega Upload to me, is that even without SOPA, we still, we, whatever, the U.S. government still was able to do that. So there are, there are long arms. Yes, sir. Uh, my, my question has to do with the, uh, the hacktivism uh, group of movements, anonymous, all set, and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, so whereas in the U.S. you had uh, Wikipedia and Google protesting SOPA, and that got shut down, you had anonymous in Poland who is, and they're you know, sh you know, sure. attacking the, the government websites, and that didn't really stop ACTA from uh, passing. So yeah. my question is, are they actually doing more harm than good from a, like a social perspective? Is anonymous or other activism groups doing more harm than good? It's almost like a Batman question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> How do we feel about Batman? <laughs> um, it's hard to say. Um, because of the hack on the Sony PlayStation Network, my Xbox Live account was stolen. They're not in my good graces right now. Although to Microsoft's you know, goodness, they did give me back my money. Thank you, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Considering I teach the kids I'm going to go program for you, it's a good thing you actually gave me back my money. <laughs> sure, that's the way the code works. Oh, you're working at Microsoft. No, it works this way. <laughs> there is a place for the white hats out there. There is a place for the black hats out there. We will never be in a society where we do not have some form of vigilante vigilanteism of some kind, I believe. Uh, wherever someone feels like they need to take the long road, it just will happen. Um, it, it, the peripheral effects, the collateral damage of such things, uh, d does give me pause. Um, the actual attacks give me even more pause because, really and truly, even if they are doing things, even if they are making laws that do go along with what we want, there are laws that protect them from, from doing what they are going to do. I mean, I, 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 if, you're going to, if you're going to object to the rules, you have to play by the rules yourself, in my opinion. So, um, you know, I, on some level, I applaud their dedication to what they do. I mean, honestly, I mean, they're very talented people. In, in these groups, and um, you know, some of these similar groups to like uh, hack the iPhone to allow us to have root access to this device, so we can do so much more interesting things with it. You know, the fact that I'm given a piece of technology that I don't have complete control over does bother me, considering it's my precious. <laughs> but on another level, we have the rules to play. Question. Yes, sir. Thank you for this talk. I was wondering how would SOPA and all these other bear attacks play a role in the fight for net neutrality? There's a, there's a demon from the past, almost. Um, from the depths, our necromancer arises <laughs> in our story, animating the dead. Net neutrality. Net neutrality was kind of the um, was the focus point for a while there. 
Um, and here's the idea. Just for those of you who don't know what net neutrality is, I won't take terribly long on this. The idea is that traffic is traffic is traffic. I am not going to slow down someone else's traffic because I have a competing product. So for instance, if you have your, your phone service through Comcast, and I decide, or you can eventually decide, oh, I'm going to switch to Vonage, Comcast isn't saying, ooh, they got Vonage. We'll make it suck. <laughs> and they find Vonage. Vonage slow down. So your mom's like, oh. <laughs> like, what? It sucks! I'll go back to Comcast. That's net neutrality. Packets have the same right. Um, in the most odorous portions of ACTA and the Trans Pacific one, there were things like deep packet analysis. Deep packet analysis means that instead of just seeing, this is it's the equivalent of someone opening your mail and reading your mail before giving you your mail. Okay? That's deep packet analysis. So it would, it would provide mechanisms to ruin net neutrality. I did not see any evidence in my investigations that net neutrality was being threatened by any way through this. I could be wrong on that because there is a lot of stuff to go through. <coughs> But to my knowledge, um, the actual packet traffic aspects of ACTA were removed, I believe, and it did not appear at all in SOPR. So to most degree, um, uh, net neutrality for today uh, is safe. Unfortunately, net neutrality is not a problem with the content. It is a little bit with the content creators because they want to slow down how you watch movies online. Make it harder to watch movies online so you'll go buy the DVD. That's kind of their idea. Um, so it's more between Comcast and Time Warner.